This ESPN podcast is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. Radio. This is the Paul Feinbaum Show. And now, Paul Feinbaum. Second hour of the program on a Friday. Uh, no SEC uh, hangover fatigue for us. Uh, we are raring to go. Many more guests to come. We've already had Reese Davis on from College Game Day. And, uh, Stuart Mandel about to join us, uh, formerly of Sports Illustrated, now with Fox Sports. And it's always good to catch up. We uh, showed one of Stuart's headlines from earlier today that uh, uh, talking about the uh, the SEC and its place with the college football playoff and look forward to uh, visiting with Stuart about that. Stuart, good afternoon. I hope the summer has been well. Oh, it's been great. How about you, Paul? It's really good. Uh, just got back from... Media days, you know what that circus is like, and I, I, want, I want to start there because the SEC, uh, uh, you expected this, but it continues to get hammered, uh, rightfully or wrongly. You, you're writing on, under the headline uh, why the SEC will never dominate the playoff. Uh, right now, I think the issue isn't so much dominating, but it's getting to the playoff. Uh, your thoughts on the SEC as we enter 2015 season? Well, SEC teams may well continue to win national championships, but I don't think, obviously, it's going to be seven straight again, for one reason being that you've got to play an extra game. And then that article was a mailbag in response to a question. If you remember when the playoff was being negotiated uh, in 2012, I mean, the SEC was just coming off that LSU-Alabama championship game. And there was a pretty big fight, if you will, between Mike Slive and Jim Delaney and Larry Scott. Those two wanted to restrict it only to conference champions, and Mike Slide obviously fought for it to be top four because at that time it seemed like his conference would, would be putting two teams in there. And I think we saw last year that's not going to happen very often in this system. They put such a reward, the committee does, on conference championships winning your conference that I think it's going to be pretty spread out. And if there are two teams, they could happen, but I don't think it's that much more likely to happen in the SEC than it would in the Big Ten or the Pac-12, any of these conferences, uh, there are going to be at-large teams that make it in. But this notion from a couple of years ago that the SEC is going to get multiple teams in every year, uh, that's just not going to happen. Yeah, and it, look, right now I think the SEC is certainly dealing with the after effects of, uh, of a pretty bad loss. Uh, it, it's funny, uh, and maybe I'm not down there very much, you don't hear a lot of people talking about Florida State losing to Oregon. You hear everyone talking about Alabama and Florida and Ohio State. Uh, why is that, Stuart? Well, I think just because Alabama has reached such a lofty perch where anything short of the national championship is considered a disappointment. I mean, we hear people talk about this team and this program as if they're in some sort of crisis, and you forget that they were SEC champs in top four last year. Um, but compared to that run in from 2009 to 2012, that seems like a bit of a letdown. And then if they had lost to Florida State, maybe that wouldn't have been so uh, controversial, if you will. But after the narrative for so long, being that the SEC was so far ahead of the Big Ten and the Big Ten could never compete, you know, for them to lose in the semifinal to Ohio State, to a Big Ten team, kind of turned that on its head. Let's talk about uh, the SEC because uh, the media, we're not sure what the media picked in Birmingham, and we're still dissecting that. Um, but uh, I am interested in your view of the league, uh, particularly uh, starting with Alabama and Auburn. I think Alabama and Auburn are both going to be very good, and I think that the West Division is as competitive as it's ever been. Uh, I've told people there are four teams, those two, Ole Miss and Texas A&M that you could convince me they're going to win the division and the conference, and you could convince me that they're going to finish fourth. It's really that uh, closely bunched together. I do think the West is way ahead of the East, and unless you're somebody who likes to pick a big upset before the season, I would think whoever you're going to pick to win the West, you're going to pick to win the conference, unless you're at media day and you pick the second-place team in the division to win the conference. 
Yeah, and, and I think there's some understanding of that. And, I, and what what my take on that is is that there's a little confusion on Auburn, and I think that's understandable. Auburn's coming off of an eight and five season, uh, a very tough schedule. And if it was an easier schedule, which there's no way to have an easier schedule in the SEC West, uh, they would have fared better. But uh, what has Auburn had that you like? And uh, maybe uh, you could also point out the downside and why maybe there was some confusion, and some people put Auburn third in the West. Well, there's, you know, pretty consensus buzz about Auburn. Like you said, they were eight and five last year. They're not being treated like that in the, in not just the SEC picks, but the national picks. And there is a lot to like. Uh, I do think it's going to be a seamless transition to Jeremy Johnson. Uh, I mean, look what he did to Arkansas in the first game last year. It was pretty impressive given how good Arkansas was on defense last season. And then, of course, there's the little must camp factor on defense, Carl Watson coming back. If I had one small concern about Auburn, uh, you know, Gus Malzahn's offense is the run first offense. It's the run heavy offense. And, you know, you saw that two years ago, the effect a guy like Trey Mason can have. I think they took a little bit of a step back in their running game last year. Is there a guy on that roster? And they may well be, but is there a guy who can be that explosive, uh, Trey Mason type running back who can take it the distance at any given time? If there is, then they're going to be awfully hard to beat. Stuart Mandel with us, of course, from Fox Sports. Uh, Stuart, the Nick Saban implosion the other day went coast to coast. Uh, I am curious from a distance how you saw it, what you heard, and what, if anything, does it mean? Well, you can safely say I saw it from a distance. I watched it from my house in California. Hmm. Um as soon as he said it, I knew how it would be interpreted, and it's unfortunate because I agree with him. I think that deadline should be pushed back, especially now that the championship game is further back. The championship game was on the 12th last year, and then the deadline was on the 15th. And meanwhile, the NFL draft has been pushed back, so I don't know why they can't push that deadline back. But the way he said it, the, the bringing up that it affected their chemistry, and this coming a year after he also talked about her chemistry and and, and some people felt making excuses about the Oklahoma law. Of course it's going to come off as whining, as making an excuse, and totally overshadowed the message. I don't know why he chose this year to make that his cause. He always seems to have a cause when he comes to media days. Uh, one, of, one of your callers said it earlier, and I agree, he has had teams in the past that had far more uh, underclass NFL draft prospects that won the national championship. Why does he think it affects this team more than others? I don't know, but certainly it comes off as an excuse, and I wish he found a different form to bring it up because I do think it's a legitimate issue. Stuart, overall, in the national scene, uh, we know Ohio State will be preseason number one. We assume TCU, two. What else do you have? Well, I don't think there's much separation between TCU and Baylor, so if TCU is two, maybe Baylor's three. Um, that they both bring back a whole lot, and obviously they were, I mean, it was a 61-58 down-to-the-wire game last year, so there's not much separating those two teams. Uh, I lost, I mean, I know Marcus Mariota's gone, but at this point, Oregon's won uh, 11 or 12 games six years in a row. To me, they're still the team to beat out West. I think Vernon Adams, the, the Juke, uh, not Juke, but coming from FCS uh, football, will be really good. I mean, this is a guy who's played Pac-12 competition and done extremely well. I don't expect a national title contender to emerge from the ACC, certainly not Florida State uh, with what they're going through. So then I would look toward, uh, well, obviously the SEC champ, but also uh, Notre Dame enters the mix. I know people don't like to hear that often, but I think that team has almost everybody coming back. They had, they were off to a great start last year, and if you remember, I mean, it came down to the last play against Florida State, and then things went downhill. They know who their quarterback's going to be now, Malik Zaire. Uh, they've got some a lot of NFL caliber talent on defense. I could see them entering the playoff mix. Stuart Mandel joining us from Fox Sports. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Paul. Good stuff. Stuart Mandel with us. We'll get back to the phone. A few more guests to go on our program, 855-242-7285. We're coming right back. Hi, I'm Joan. <laughs> Hey, welcome 
welcome you back. Uh, it's good to have you uh, on board. We'll get to some more calls. And Bill is up next in Tennessee. Thanks for the phone call, Bill, and good afternoon. Paul, thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I called today to talk about, well, I'm listening to all this hype about who's going to win what in the SEC, and I see it as a big, fat question mark. Um, Alabama could have a rough year this year. If they don't get a good quarterback in there, that's a question that's unanswered. Everybody talks about, well, not everybody, but a lot of the sports writers are talking about Auburn as coming out as number one, and I can't see that either. Maybe, but uh, they've, they've got a defense that's going to have to step up better. They really do. They're, they're going to have to play better football, and that might not happen in one year. Everybody's talking about Tennessee, and I'm a Tennessee fan, man. You cut me, and I bleed orange. But uh, Tennessee's playing with a lot of sophomores this year and not a lot of depth. Uh, they've got the second game of the year with Oklahoma, which is going to be a tough physical game. And that, to me, is going to be a barometer for the team this year. It's going to tell me who Tennessee really is. And then a couple games later, they start with Florida, and they've got a six-game run, Florida, Arkansas, Georgia. I'm looking at the schedule here. Then they got a bye week, and they got Alabama, Kentucky, and South Carolina. They have got a very tough uh, uh, middle schedule, and they're not going to come through this unscathed. Uh, it's going to be physical football. It's going to be tough line play, and I worry about our depth. Uh, we start a lot of sophomores, and we've got freshmen and sophomores on the bench. We don't have a lot of seniors on this team. And people that think they're going to win the SEC East this year, I think, are just hoping. A lot of people are excited, and I'm excited too, but <laughs> I don't really see that. I still think Georgia's the front runner. Um, I look at Arkansas, and Arkansas could be like Tennessee. They could surprise a lot of people in the West. I really like Coach Boyman. I've liked him since he was at Wisconsin. When I see this guy out there, when I listen to him talk, I can imagine what it would be like in a practice with him. I would play football for this guy. I like Butch Jones, don't get me wrong. He is a, a good coach. He's done a lot for Tennessee, and, and I'm hoping he turns out to be a great coach. Um, I don't know. The only other question I got, you mentioned something earlier in the program about uh, some of Tennessee's players, maybe six of them, being involved in a sex scandal last year that was kind of brushed over or not paid attention to i'd like to know more about that because i really that's the first i've heard of it and and it's kind of a yeah well, well john it's it's fairly complex and uh, these are allegations and i think it's uh, yeah, I'm, if you follow the news uh, tennessee has had uh, quite a few problems it's, it's a, but, but i will say this and there's been some criticism about Tennessee, uh, Butch, jo Butch Jones has dealt with each and every one of these. Can Florida State make the same claim? Jim is next up in Tuscaloosa. How are you, Jim? Well, I don't know. I mean, you tell me. Uh, <laughs> the one thing I, you did right today uh, earlier was uh, cut short that, that goober, uh, Lance, Tennessee, Florida, whatever he is. And that was good, Paul, but, you know, you need to, you know, this SEC stuff is really getting me down because, Paul, this is uh, the open week, and I know you know that, and I know you used to cover that, and now you need to, well, you did talk about it a little bit between the break while ago on TV, but people on the radio didn't hear that. And, and come on, Paul, I mean, you do know a little something. I taught you, I taught you a little something about how well, God has I'll say this. I'll say this, Jim, and uh, unfortunately, uh, based on what I did yesterday and where I've been today and yeah. what I've been doing, I have not had a chance to see the Open. So, uh, um, well, have you got it on the studio? Can, well, they, well, yeah, well, look, I, I know I mean, Universal. I do, but, uh, but Jim, uh, I have I have eight monitors here. It's not yeah, even focused. And anymore. I know Universal has just now hired Marcus Spears. Well, uh, and, and they might hire me if I keep talking about Universal rather than Disney World. Mm-hmm. But if, if you'll send me to Disney World, I'll, I'll, I'll hype them, you know. You know I'll hype somebody if they do me a favor. By the way, Paul, there's a girl from tennis, I mean, uh, Auburn. This, I liked her sunglasses when she uh, followed me on Twitter. And she said, I'll, I'll send you a pair uh, uh, to find bomb. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, you know, that's probably just a joke. But in case she does, I'm sure you'll forward them to me, won't you? 
You bet, Jim. Oh, that's great, Paul. You're so enthusiastic. Well, Jim, I, I'll be honest with you, Jim. I have no earthly idea what you're talking about. You call up I here. Do. You start. I, I mean, how does anyone on. in Missouri uh, or Montana or, or Monterey have any earthly idea what you're talking about? Okay, well, let me explain it. I, okay, a, a chick followed me on Twitter. A chick? Yeah, a girl. Uh, okay. She's from Auburn. She's got an Auburn thing on there, you know, whatever you call yeah. it. Okay. And she's kind of cute girl, about 35, 30. That's and uh, she had on a nice pair of sunglasses, and I said, those are neat. I like them. She said, I'll send you a pair. I'll send them to Pine Bomb. I said, okay, that's great. You got it now, Paul? Has, has America got it? I finally figured it out. Hey, Jim, listen, I'm not, I'm not as sharp as I used to be. You know that. You well, that I do out. know that, Paul. That's what's bothering me. I really do know that you're not as sharp as you used to. I yeah. tried to sharpen you up. You I, know, I, I, a, I am just uh, I'm like Tiger Woods. I just can't find the fairway anymore. Well, that's pathetic, and he is done. I, I agree now. He is absolutely done. He'll never return. He's not Jack Nicklaus, and he can't return. And you know what's wrong, Paul? You know why he can't return? Because he's got too much pride. Too much pride. I mean, too much pride will keep you from doing the little humble you things know, you I'll, need I'll to do. I'll tell you this, though, Jim, but you, you should know this more than anyone else. If you understand the game of golf, you cannot write. You cannot write someone off based on a performance. Tom Watson went uh, what, what months and not years. The last two years. Nicholas man. Nicholas uh, struggled for two or three years before he won the Masters. Uh, golf is strange. Uh, a baseball pitcher when, once once he's done, he's done. But I, I would well, I would, I would dare fat. say that uh, you, you better. You I would not write Tiger Woods. Right. You're the one that asked me about my golf opinion. I'm trying to yeah. give it. Well, you did. And let me let me say something okay. now. Okay. Without interruption, if you don't mind. Look, I'm talking about stupid things the guy's doing there. It's not a, when you start doing stu Nicholas never did stupid things when he was in a decline, did he? I don't, I don't mean, I don't think he did. All I'm telling you is Paul, I mean, uh, Tiger is doing stupid stuff. For example, uh, he, he's hitting it bad today, and I saw him, you know, he goes to the next tee, and he pulls driver, hits driver way over in the, in the trees, you know. I mean, you, when you're playing bad like that, Paul, you take a three wood, you take a two iron. Where, where, uh, where, where, where are there trees at St. Andrews? Well, not trees, but there were shrubbery. It was some kind of shrubbery because he oh, was yeah. in it about an hour ago. He had to take a drop. Do you not recall? I wasn't. Maybe you I mean, Jim, I, I haven't seen two shots in the whole tournament. Well, I'm t he had to take a drop because he hit it in the in the big tall shrubbery somewhere on the. So mm -hmm. I agree. There's something. I, they're not trees, but they're high shrubbery. You know, or whatever. You who, call do you, it. who do you like? You know what? Uh, of course, I like Spieth now. I hope he wins it because it'd be great for sports. It'd be great, and he's got. And he probably will. I think he. I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think. I think. Dustin's going to win. No, no. I think Dustin's a dog. <laughs> Dustin's incredible hitting the ball from tee to green. But you know, for some reason, he's choked two times in the last two years. Or two, in, in the last two years, two times he's choked in a major when he had it won. I don't know. He'll have to prove it to me. But he's. He's he's hard to beat. I mean, the way he hits it, he's, it's going to be hard to beat if he continues to putt well like he's doing now. Uh, I tell you, though, Paul, you need to talk about the golf a little bit. I mean, SEC, what do you mean? Why so much SEC? And why the implosion uh, remark regarding Slavin? You think he imploded? I didn't say he imploded. I said the implosion uh, concerning you what he what said. The implosion of Nick Saban. Uh, well, first of all, I know what I said. and, and there's I a did difference. too, Paul. Oh, okay. Well, go ahead. I, I want to hear it. Well, I, mean, my, I was I was asking him to react to the towering inferno that occurred after Saban's comments. And, and, and Jim, listen, uh, it did. It, w w you you heard our, or maybe you didn't because you no, were I watching didn't, the golf channel the other day. Okay, well, for those who did, for those people who <laughs> did care about the SEC media <laughs> days, come on, come on, Paul. You're getting better. You're getting better. Come on. We uh, we had pretty interesting. You would have enjoyed our roundtable on Wednesday afternoon, Jim. We had. I just heard Spears say that when you when he made the remark about Universal, you said, "Oh no, you're gonna be you're gonna be fired." You. Uh, I didn't, uh, Jim. I did not say that. I just said we work for Disney. <laughs> Paul, can we talk about Universal? Does it have to be all Disney? I don't, listen, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care what you talk about. I've never stopped you from saying anything. No, no, you haven't, Paul. You have, but you stopped Marcus. Well, I was trying to point out to Marcus, uh, he's, about, he's, he's about to move his family, uh, that uh, if you're going to uh, work here, be cognizant of the owner. Good night, Paul. He just mentioned Universal. universal. He didn't say I'm going to No, he, he didn't just mention it. He said he, he prefers Universal to Disney World. So you can't speak your mind anymore on the phone. No, you, you could. Uh, uh, Jim, let's get the context correct. 
He's taking his family to Orlando. I asked him if he's going to Disney World. He said, no, I prefer Universal. That's when I made my point. And you made it about five minutes worth. No, and you see. stopped it in the ground, Paul. Okay. Well, I learned from you, Jim. You don't, you don't ever just make a subtle point. You drive it home hard. Well, you're supposed to drive it home hard. Well, in that case, though, you, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, now I screwed my own uh, case up here. But in that case, I mean, good night. You just stretch that and stretch that. And, I mean, I, come on, Paul. Let's, let's talk. I mean, I, I, I don't get the chance to talk to you that much. I, I, I'm trying to... I'm trying to get something. Well, okay, let's, let's move on from Marcus. What else would you like to talk about? Well, you bring something up, we'll go to it, all right? Because we need to discuss the issue. How about Donald Trump and the, and the rising in the polls and Hillary, Hillary dropping so, like, a, she just dropping, you know, like, like a, a, a sinking ship? Well, uh, listen, I think uh, Donald Trump uh, is one of the most interesting developments you know, we've yeah, seen. I'm going to be honest with you, Paul. I, I, I am being serious now. I think, you know, I'm a pretty bright boy. You know, sure. pretty oh, yeah. bright. No I, oh, I, no, I, doubt. No, no, no doubt. No doubt. But, but here's my point, Paul. These morons that keep talking about Donald Trump couldn't run the country. He's just a businessman. What more now do we need than a businessman? Tell you tell me. You're a, you're a business guy. Well, uh, if you're going to be the president, uh, you do have to have business acumen. You have to have executive uh, understanding. He has all that. You also have to understand a little bit about diplomacy as well, because otherwise uh, the world would will be blowing up. I mean, would you would you trust Donald Trump during a nuclear crisis? As much as anybody I know of, Paul. As okay. much as any I'm running. Let me just preface by saying, as much or more than any of the clowns, I would, uh, as much as Jeb Bush, uh, Jeb Bush has got that blood in him that'll attack anything if it moves. Even if it doesn't, <laughs> you know, even if it doesn't, uh, a preemptive strike, you know, like we used to talk about. You know, you're, Jim, you're, let me, let, can we talk? Yeah, let's talk. You're missing your call. You're, you're wasted in sports. You need to be a, poli a political... I told you I quit sports, Paul. I am a you political... You need to be a political fan. commentator. You would be I hilarious. am a political... And the best on this show that ever, you've ever oh, seen. No doubt. No doubt. So can we continue? Or you want to go on to another day? I mean, I'll talk for now, uh, now on Morning Joe, let's bring in Jim from Tuscaloosa. Look, look, Paul, the other day you had on some clown. Who was it? You let that person talk for 30 dadgum minutes. I don't remember who it was, but... I said, I said, legend, look at this. He and I talked after the show, you know, we talk. I said, what do you think about Paul letting that clown go on for 30 minutes? I mean, was this a guest or a caller? It was a caller. No, no caller other than you has ever gone on that long. <laughs> well, that's a smart, one of the smart things you've done, and that's why you're going to be in my book, Paul. That's why you made my book. You'll be in the chapter. I hope so. I, I hope you. I get more than one page. Well, I didn't get, I didn't even get a whole page. Uh, you got that page 54, though. <laughs> Okay, you tell me, is, is, is Dustin going to win it, or do you think Spieth's Spieth, coming? Spieth, Spieth can well, I, I, mean, I don't even know where Spieth is right now in the tournament. He's, five, but, yeah. he's six under. I, I like Dustin. I th I, I'm a big believer in bouncing back after. I mean, he, he, he's almost come back before, but I think he's uh, as good as anyone other than Spieth right now on the tour. I agree, but can he win a major? Well, Phil Mickelson finally won after years of choking. Uh, Tom Watson won. Greg Norman one and choked about 15 more times. Uh, I've seen it happen. Do a public service right now since we are talking. Right now, I turned to ESPN, you know, and watching you and watching God a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right now, is that live? It can't be live after nine at 9.30 over there. It's six hours ahead of us. It can't yeah, be live. They, they, yeah, it's live. They have, they have another... Uh, I mean, what is going on? They have another uh, couple of... Uh, let's, they have a couple more minutes of light over there. Uh, I think the sun goes down... I've only been to England one time, but the sun goes down around 9.30 or 10 uh, this time of the year. Did not know that. I thought it was like Alabama where it was like no. 8.30. No, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit later than that. And it's also a month later that the, that, that the break of the light. You know, the light started turning. In other words, it started getting uh, darker sooner a month ago. You know, yeah, I was, in, I was in Alabama for four days. I, 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 the sun, uh, I saw, it was out It was out till about 8 o'clock yesterday. I know, but it was dark at night at 8.30. Okay. Now they're telling me we need to go to a break. I hate to run. I mean, well, we're they're running the show if they get me and you to off together because we, we can talk some stuff, can't Yeah, you? no, I, I, it's already Saturday morning in the, in, <laughs> in, in, in the United States. Good talking to you, Paul. You've sharpened up in the last five Thank minutes. Thank you, Jerry. I feel, I feel so much better, Jerry, now that you I always feel good talking to you. I was down in the, down in the dumps when the show started, but I, I feel great now. Well, you ought to be peppy now, and I hope you can continue through the rest of the show. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a short break. Uh, you're watching. <laughs> that was Jim from Tuscaloosa, the uh, Fine Bomb Show political correspondent. He'll be in Iowa next Monday, New Hampshire on Tuesday, South Carolina on Wednesday, as we cover Jim covering the Republican primaries coming up in a few months. 
When our water heater broke... back. Uh, good to have everyone uh, back on the program, and uh, Jim will be on Meet the Press Sunday with, I can't remember who hosts Meet the Press anymore. Brock Hewitt uh, joins us right now, and we're delighted to welcome our friend uh, from across the country uh, to talk some college football. Brock, I hope the summer has been good. Good afternoon. It has been good. Thanks for playing a little bit of Hank there. Good country boys can survive, even on the West Coast. <laughs> when it's 90 degrees and sunny as it's been most of the summer. So all good. Looking forward to seeing you here soon enough and getting closer and closer to kickoff. You bet, uh, Brock. Uh, we were, we just got back from uh, media days, and everywhere we went, the buzz was uh, pretty bright and, uh, and and powerful on Tennessee. I know you have some pretty interesting opinions on the balls and how they'll fare. They keep Mr. Dobbs healthy. They will make some noise in the East. Uh, I love the fact uh, if you're a volunteer fan, you get a lot of games in your building this year. I think the schedule at least favorable in that way, as favorable as, as it can be for any SEC team. Sure, they've got their gauntlet, but they, they've got to keep their quarterback upright. That's been problematic uh, over the years in that system, certainly for Butch there in Knoxville. So this all hinges on him, and I know that's no grand analysis, so I'll keep your quarterback healthy. That, that's brilliant stuff, but really for them, they have nothing behind them. they got enough weapons at receiver and at running back, some key pieces to their defensive front, a little bit weaker SEC East, and as I said, a favorable schedule. I, I think they can make some noise. I think they can get to eight, possibly nine wins, and if the quarterback stays healthy all season long, uh, they're going to be highly competitive. Certainly, uh, on the, on the other side, uh, we went back and forth all week between Alabama and Auburn. How do you see that battle? Yeah, I probably, I probably give the nod to Auburn. And, and just about everybody I have talked to, Paul, in this entire offseason, I'm just finishing putting a little, a little piece together for ESPN the magazine in the college football preview and have talked to more people and they are the buzz. When you want to talk about the glow and the hype and the buzz, I think so much of it has really been around what Gus has, the obvious addition of Will Muschamp, what he's going to bring, I think, defensively with some of the talent they have on hand. I think the scheme that allows them to, to play to some of the strength of that athleticism and personnel defensively. And you know, I, I, I think I probably right now, before we ever take a snap, I do favor I do favor Auburn. I am, like everybody else, concerned about laying in that quarterback position. And and that is that is grossly unsettled. Uh, I think there's great debate, and it won't be settled until Jacob Coker takes some live bullets. They will try to scrimmage, I'm sure, a ton. Uh, Nick Saban loves competition. He's going to do the best he can to weed that position out in scrimmages in August. But ultimately, it's the 100,000 sitting in that stadium, and whether or not Jacob Coker can handle the expectations and the pressure. He couldn't do it a year ago. Uh, he's got to make a massive stride to do it this year. Uh, but still, that position being unsettled gives, I think, Auburn the hand going in. I know you, you talked a little bit about Auburn. Uh, Alabama just can't help for being in the news. Nick Saban made some very interesting comments this week about uh, he thinking his players were affected by the, the NFL evaluation. Uh, Brock, uh, your thoughts on, on what he said, and, uh, and does it ring? I mean, I, he, I know his suggestions ring true, but do you think it really affected his players against Ohio State? Uh, well, two, I think that's two different things. I think on the field, no. Ohio State was better. The, the big game coach, Urban Meyer, got that team ready to play, and they physically handled Alabama in a way that I don't think really many people expected them to do. So the, that's on the field. Off the field, there's going to be unintended consequences when you're one of the most powerful voices in college football, and I put Nick Saban in that territory. And, and, and this is not the first time you've been at those media days. I've been at them through the years. You're at some of those press conferences with Nick. He's not afraid to state his opinion. But with those opinions will come, as I said, those two key words, unintended consequences that everybody will reach and grab onto. I loved his sit down with you later and he said, no, it's just, no, we lost. We got our butts kicked. What do you, what do you want me to do? We didn't, we didn't own. I'm not making any excuses, but 
But when you're as big and as powerful as he has and as accomplished as he has in the game, and people will at times take and, and, and run with things that you have to say. Talking to Brock Heward, and finally, Brock, I would like to get your thoughts on LSU. They were picked to finish third. I mean, I felt a lot of the um, fuel and momentum for LSU. Certainly seeing uh, Leonard Fournette uh, was, was a bright sight early in the morning with those red pants. But uh, there are people in LSU that, they're, they're, I mean, they love the talent down there. I mean, you can't help but like what he has on that field, although there remains a question of quarterback. Well, I think LSU in some ways uh, mirrors some of the rest of the conference. And, and you said on that set with, with Joey and, and, and Davey and, and Tess and, and talked about maybe some of the less buzz, some of the less hype, or maybe some of the overattention within the conference. And, and I think the more I, I dig into this, Paul, I think a lot of it has to do with that position. That run in McCarran and Manziel and Mettenberger and Murray and even Connor Shaw was record-setting in so many ways with wins with stats and, and in stature. And, 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 and I think that was the highlight of the SEC in, a, in an unbelievable run of seven straight titles. But that position was empty a year ago, and I think it affected the conference largely. And I think it's, it's just as empty this season. I think there's a lot of pretty average offensive lines as well in the SEC this year. And, and until those two positions, and especially the one under center, are solidified, much like my analysis with Alabama, how do you feel good about it? I don't care what level it is, high school, college, pro. When you've got that guy under center, that franchise quarterback, you feel good about your odds and you feel good about your chances, like an ace pitcher in baseball. I got my pitching staff in rotation. I feel good about my odds. I don't have it, like Alabama, like LSU. It makes me pretty uncomfortable to think that they're anywhere close to what they were when they were national title winners. Brock Hewitt, uh, the first of hopefully many appearances uh, with us here. Uh, Brock, thanks. I uh, hope you enjoy whatever left of this summer, and we will see you very soon. Sounds great, Paul. Look forward to it. You got it. Brock Hewitt uh, joining us lives out in Seattle. Quick break, and uh, more of your calls, 855-242-7285. It's been a fun show. Much more to come as we roll on on a Friday afternoon. Program. Let's get to some more calls. A few more guests to go, and uh, we've had a busy one. Uh, Reese Davis opened it up a couple of hours uh, ago. Frankie is in uh, Alabama. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, Mr. Stombaum. Uh, I called earlier, and we were talking about the SEC West uh, preseason predictions, and we got, I think I got disconnected, but I, I just kind of wanted to add on what uh, Mr. Hewitt was talking about. I think it is Auburn and Alabama in the West, and it's going to come down to you know who fits the who fits the role best role at quarterback for Alabama and what Auburn's defense does and behind them I think it's really you know uh, a, a toss up uh, I saw LSU up there ranked up pretty high in the preseason rankings in the West and that kind of made me scratch my head a little bit but um, then behind them you got you got Arkansas which is an up and coming team you got the two Mississippi's. And then you got A and M. You don't ever know what you're going to get out of them. They've always got good players, and I just kind of want to get your thoughts on uh, why LSU may be favored so high in the West. Well, they're picked to finish third, so I, I don't know. Some would argue that's not all that high in relation to LSU history. I think what you have is you have two teams at the top in Alabama and Auburn. Most people believe the Iron Bowl will determine and decide the SEC West. And then you have, take your pick. Do you like Ole Miss? Do you like LSU? Do you think A&M can make some noise? Or what about Arkansas? I mean, I really, uh, I mean, I have my opinions, you have yours, but uh, you can make a case for any of those four. Well, I think that, you know, it, if LSU can ever get a quarterback, that's, you know, that was a problem last year. But if you ask me, I mean, they're never going to be as successful as they were when Saban was there. I mean, with the Mad Hatter, you know, they're in the ship. I mean, they made it to a – they won a BCS championship, and then they played Alabama a few years ago. But um, they're always going to have good players. just comes down to, I guess, 
if they get the right quarterback. Well, that's that's what it's always about. Tammy is up next. Tammy, good afternoon. Hey, Paul. Hi there. First of all, I get started, I'd like to say it was so good seeing Robert, wasn't it? Uh, you better believe it. Uh, it was a, a thrill, and I was uh, I was so glad. It, it's not easy to get people upstairs at the SEC media days, but uh, John and a lot of other and Mark and so many other people worked hard to uh, to make it uh, possible. So we were able to get him on our show Wednesday afternoon. Well, I told him to make sure he told Nick Saban more eager. But I don't know if he got it in. No, uh, I don't think he did. I think uh, I think he talked to Coach Saban, but uh, I think he was more interested in Coach Saban knowing. Yeah. Who he was rather than uh, he was an Auburn fan. But uh, anyway, I want to get back to the reason I called other than that. I don't know who that guy was called earlier. But, you know, I can't believe that out, they rated Auburn overall, but yet they still got Alabama number one in the West. These voters out here, who are the voters? The coaches or the, just the media itself? Well, I'll explain it again, Tammy. Uh, the reason that happened, some people voted Auburn lower, uh, third in the SEC. Alabama, I think, was mostly picked first or second. So Auburn yeah, lost I know. A Y'all always picking Alabama. Y'all always picking Alabama to be anything except losers. And that's what they are, the big L loser, like they always are. Because Oh my God! Y'all just all oh, y'all. You know y'all. Hey, Amy, can you can you explain to me why it really matters to you? Auburn because, was, you know what? Auburn it was picked to finish. To because school. Auburn don't never get ranked number one. Paul Feinbaum. That's why they never, they always have to work their way to the top. No matter if they got the hardest schedule out there. Now here we are with a cupcake schedule this year, and we can't even get voted number one. But yet we Damn have it, the Tammy, if you would quit screaming long enough to listen, Auburn was the pick to win the Southeastern Conference. What difference does it make if they weren't the pick to win the SEC West? Why, why can't you just take the, the good and forget the bad? They're the pick to win the league. Well, yeah, you know why they picked the winning league? Because we are going to win the league. They, at least they got that part right. Because they, they ain't nobody else going to win, I promise you that. Nobody in the SEC is going to win. And all them voters out there that voted Alabama to win, the is and the best in the way is before even get started, they're about as ignorant as that dang black man over there in Georgia. He's ignorant, too. They're as ignorant as he is. Who are you talking about? That black man over there in Georgia. He's the most ignorant. Man, I have ever heard speak in the United States of America. You know, that guy over there in Georgia, he's, but my husband said what he was the president of. What is, what what is it? What, who, who, I'm still lost on this person that you're referring to. What is his name? I can't remember his name, Papa. You know, he's over there in Georgia in that park over there, that Confederate park, park over there, wanting to take scratch off names of Confederate soldiers and break down the monuments over there and sell off the raw, sell off the monument. Out of the parts, out of the Confederate parts over there. Do you realize how ignorant that black man is? I don't care if he's black, we was black, he just happened to be a black man to see it. He's over there, we said that. I mean, he literally said that on TV, that come out of his mouth. Does he not realize what the history of America, of the United States is, of the United States of America is? Does he not realize how he even come to this world and how he got to be where he's at because of all that that happened in the history? And he's wanting to take it away. First, first of all, Tammy, what, what happened? What are we talking about? He got on there, Paul, and a, a lady that was a teacher now, she was a black lady. Oh. And she had more sense than this guy that's supposed to be representing some kind of organization. She had more sense, and she's a black lady, and she had children there that she was taking through that park, Paul, and she was telling them about the history. And you know what? She never once even thought about that flag. And you know, she had to nurse, she said it herself. We have all genders and races, ra racial children here with me. And I teach him the history. And you know she said that none of them ever look at that flag other than different, that it's a part of history. Geico presents Strange Savings Stories.
Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. And now, for Geico's edition of Stuff Found in Your Car, we go inside your side door pocket. Hello, yes, the crumpled receipt with gum in it. From your anniversary dinner, you sprang for expensive wine, your server was Beth. That dinner was a couple hundred dollars. Money you could get back if you switched to Geico and saved hundreds of dollars on your car insurance. I bet you'd save that receipt. Frame it, even. But really, where did I go wrong? Was it the corkage fee? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit Geico.com today. The Boston Red Sox begin the second half with a road trip to the AL West, where they'll face Mike Trout and the LA Angels. Dives in, and he made the catch! First pitch is Sunday at 8 Eastern on ESPN and on ESPN Radio.